Minister of Royal Mail Group Limited and Communication Workers Union. Lord, uh, in this matter I appear with my learned friend Stuart Brittenden for the appellant union. My learned friend Mr Bruce Carr QC appears for the uh, respondent Royal Mail Group. Yes, may I, uh, before you get going, just um, uh, pause to offer you the court's congratulations on your elevation, which oh, we were all very pleased to hear about. Very, very kind, my lord, thank you. As your lordships know, this is a rolled up application for permission, and if permission gra is granted, then uh, it's the hearing of the appeal as well against the judgment of Mr Justice Swift on the 13th of November. Can I just uh, uh, ask your Lordships whether your Lordships are, are fully equipped? There should be a, a core bundle which contains the judgment together with a rather larger bundle of witness statements and exhibits. Yes, I think we've got all that. And, Supplementary um, bundle. A rather bulky bundle of authorities uh, and some uh, further papers came in uh, yesterday evening uh, to do with respondents' notice and further evidence and so forth. I'm obliged. Well, you know that. Well, our skeleton is in the core bundle, but <coughs> uh, Mr. Carr's is not, so you should have his sep separately. Yes. Lord, it, it, um, as your Lordship observes, there, there is an issue about f some further evidence. I was proposing to deal with that quite late in my submissions, if that's convenient. Yes. And indeed, Mr. I'm going to ask Mr. Brittenden to deal with that aspect of it. Lord, so there, there is a film here, or uh, uh, some uh, excerpts from uh, social media. Take, they take about 10 minutes to view, and at a convenient point, I would invite your Lordships to, to view that. Well, we have done. We were provided with a DVD with um, what I assume uh, contained all the excerpts, and we have taken the opportunity to look at that uh, in preparation for this hearing. So unless there is something which you... Um, as it were, particularly want to point out to us, uh, there may be no need to do that. Uh, I, from our side, I, I, I doubt that there will be any request to, to view any of that uh, again. Yes, thank you. Lord, as, as your Lordships know, the case concerns the validity of an overwhelming uh, ballot for industrial action by postal workers I can tell you, Lordship, that there will be no industrial action. I can tell you, Lordship, as I told uh, Mr Justice Swift, there will be no industrial action on the strength of that ballot unless uh, and until uh, the court rules uh, that uh, the industrial action may lawfully uh, proceed. Should your Lordships make that finding, I can also tell you, Lordships, that there will be no industrial action before the conclusion of the general election on the 12th of December 2019. Yes, thank you. Lords, uh, I, I propose to deal with this in five stages. The first is to consider very briefly the statutory provisions but without making submissions in relation to them. Secondly, to consider the central factual features of this case. Thirdly, to look at our uh, look at the authorities and the legal framework in a bit more detail. Fourthly, to consider the issue of further evidence, which I don't think will take long. And finally, to deal with our submissions on section 230 in the order in which they're presented in our skeleton uh, argument. Lord, Lords, factually, the uh, issues are quite straightforward. This was a postal ballot conducted amongst postal workers in which the union encouraged a number of things. First of all, it encouraged the members to vote. Secondly, it encouraged the members to vote yes in favour of industrial action. Thirdly, it encouraged the, vote, the, the members to vote as soon as they could. And fourthly, in relation to those members who worked in sorting offices where letters are, are sorted and subsequently delivered, it encouraged members to take their own letter from the frames into which the uh, letters are sorted, open that letter, take out the 
ballot paper, fill it in, put it in the stamped addressed return envelope, seal that envelope, and then to join, if possible, with colleagues outside to be filmed posting those ballots in the post box to be returned by post to the scrutineer. Lords, I, I then uh, come to the uh, essential statutory provisions in the Act. Uh, my Lord, these are in the fat volume of authorities are at tab uh, one. And I invite your Lordships to go to section 219 to begin with. Section 219 is a section which derives originally from the Trade Disputes Act of 1906, which gave protection to trade unions from tort liability in respect of the torts which inevitably follow when industrial action is, is called. And Section 219 is now somewhat restricted, but the central provision of relevance here is 219.1a, an act done by a person in contemplation or furtherance of a trade dispute is not actionable in tort on the ground only, a, that it induces another person to break a contract or interferes or induces another person to interfere with its performance, or uh, that it consists in threatening that a contract uh, will be broken. And then subsection t t 2 deals with conspiracy and uh, a 3 deals with picketing. Your Lordships are not concerned uh, with that. So the talk that would inevitably follow and on which the a Royal Mail Group would rely is that a strike call to postal workers would involve inducing them to break their contracts of employment with Royal Mail Group. So in order to have lawful industrial action, it's necessary for the union to rely on Section 219. Lord, before I deal with the other parts of 219, we don't have... I'm sorry, that's my fault. We don't have section 244, but it's not necessary to go there. I can tell your Lordships what section 244 says. It's the definition of a trade dispute. And essentially it's matters to do with terms and conditions of employment, uh, the engagement or non-engagement of workers and facilities for union officials and for collective bargaining. Well, there's obviously so, no issue about that in this case. There's no issue about that at all. So the, the first part of uh, 219.1 is fulfilled. This is a contemplational furtherance of a trade dispute. But your Lordships read on in section 219 that in relation to uh, subsection 4, those protective sections have effect subject to sections 222 to 225, Sections 226 and 234A, uh, so that the union has to fulfil uh, a number of other requirements in order that its uh, industrial action can attract the protection of section 219. Laws, I turn the page then to section 221 which imposes restrictions on the grant of injunctions and interdicts, and the relevant uh, subsection here is subsection 2, where an application for an interlocutory injunction is made to a court pending trial of an action, and the party against, it, against whom it sought claims that he acted in contemplation of further trade dispute, the court shall, in exercising its discretion, whether or not to grant the injunction, have regard to the likelihood of that party succeeding at the trial of the action in establishing any matter which would afford a defence to the action under section 219, but it does, that doesn't apply to uh, Scotland. So uh, cyanamide, yes, but cyanamide also tempered by the court having to have regard to the likelihood of the union's success <coughs> in under section 219. Uh, 
Lord, then at 2 2, section 226, the requirement of a ballot before action by a trade uh, union, an act done by a trade union to induce a person to take part, continue to take part in industrial action, A, is not protected unless the industrial action has the support of a uh, ballot. And then there's, it must comply with 226A uh, as well. And subsection 2 provides that industrial action shall be regarded as having the support of a ballot only if the unions have hold, ha, has held a ballot in respect of the action in relation to which the requirements of 226B uh, were satisfied in relation to which the requirements of 227 to 231 were satisfied, and 2A, in, a, in which at least 50% of those who were entitled to vote in the ballot did so. So there's a primary threshold that at least 50% of the <coughs> constituent electorate must have voted, whether yes or no. Uh, and Little three is that the required number of persons answered yes to the question applicable in accordance with 229A to industrial action of the kind to which the act of inducement re relates. So there has to be a majority in favour of industrial uh, action. And that is confirmed by uh, subsection 2, capital A, the required number of persons, is the majority voting in the uh, ballot. And there is an additional requirement which doesn't apply in the case of postal workers. If your lordships look down to 2C, 2B, there's an additional requirement. And 2C, the additional requirement is that at least 40% of those who are entitled to vote in the ballot answered yes to the question, and that is in relation to important public services, and your Lordship sees over the page of 2E that important public services does not include uh, the postal uh, service. Yes, but I had wondered whether um, important public service might apply to postal workers during a general election, but um, clearly it doesn't. It, 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 it <laughs> Would you say doesn't. it's excluded? I'm so sorry, Where do you say postal workers are identified? They're not identified. Oh, I'm sorry, they're the just not included. They're not that identified. It excludes them from the yes. exhaustive list in, in 2E. Yeah. Well, at 226B, the next uh, section in the clip is the appointment of a scrutineer. And the scrutineer has to take such steps as appear to him to be appropriate for the purpose of enabling him to make a report to the trade union. She has to do at least four, within four weeks of the end of the ballot. And uh, provisions about qualification and the trade union under subsection 3 shall ensure that the scrutineer duly carries out the functions conferred on him under subsection 1. And there is no interference with the carrying out of those functions from the union or any of its members, officials or employees. The trade union shall comply with all reasonable requests made by the uh, scrutineer. Then 2.30, conduct of the ballot. And this is the material section, of course. Subsection 1 says every person who is entitled to vote in the ballot must A, be allowed to vote without interference from or constraint imposed by the union or any of its members, officials or employees, and B, so far as is reasonably practicable, be enabled to do so without incurring any direct cost to himself. Uh, two, except as regards persons falling within 2A, uh, which in, uh, concerns merchant C for her, Fairers, so far as is reasonably practicable, every person who is entitled to vote in the ballot must have a voting paper sent to him by post at his home address or any other address which he has requested the trade union in writing to treat as his postal address and B, be given a convenient opportunity to vote by post. 
2A deals with the conditions involved for merchant <coughs> seafarers, and it, it will be seen that uh, merchant uh, seamen can uh, vote whilst at their workplace on ship or somewhere uh, nearby where the ship uh, is. We, we're not concerned with that. And subsection 4 provides that a ballot shall be conducted so as to secure that A, so far as is reasonably practicable, those voting do so in secret, and B, the votes given in the ballot are fairly and accurately counted. For the purposes of parallel <coughs> B, an inaccuracy in counting shall be disregarded if it is accidental and on a scale which couldn't affect the result of the ballot. Lord 231B deals with a scrutineer's report, and the scrutineer at 231B1A has to state whether he or she is satisfied that there are no reasonable grounds for believing that there was any contravention of a requirement imposed by or under any enactment in relation to the ballot, B, that the arrangements made with the respect to the production, storage, distribution, return or other handling of voting papers used in the ballot and the arrangements for the counting of the votes, including all such security arrangements as were reasonably practicable for the purpose of minimising the risk that any unfairness or malpractice might occur and that he's been able to carry out the functions conferred upon him by 226B1 without any interference from the trade union or any of its members, officials or employees. And if he's not satisfied as to any of those matters, the report shall give particulars of his reason for not being satisfied as to that matter. And then there, there's a six months from the date of the ballot during which any person entitled to vote or the employer of any such person requests a copy of the scrutineer's report, the trade union must, as soon as practicable, provide him with one, either free of charge or on payment of such reasonable fee as may be specified by the union. Lords, Mr Carr and I think that those are the only provisions you uh, might need to refer to. Mr Carr's included section 51 right at the beginning of this, which I won't read, but your Lordship will see, contains rather similar provisions for ballots for the election of the principal executive uh, committee of a union. Now that, that election, uh, such an election, is not an issue in this case, but uh, the wording is similar, if not identical. Lords, with that, I turn to the central features of the case, which are, in our respectful submission, these. First of all, this was one of three ballots conducted by the CWU over the same period of time. And this, of course, was the primary ballot. I'll describe the other two in a moment. But this was a ballot with an electorate of members of the CWU employed by Royal Mail Group, an electorate of 110,292 potential voters. That was the number of voting papers that were sent out by the scrutineer, Electoral Reform Services, to the members of the union entitled to vote. It's not said that anybody who wasn't entitled to vote voted or that anybody who was entitled to vote didn't get a ballot, ballot paper. Of that electorate, 83,704 members voted one way or the other. That is a turnout of 76%. Of those that voted, 81,232 voted in favour of industrial action. That is a percentage of 97. 97% of the voters voted in favour of industrial action. 97.1, Mr. Carr corrects me. Oh, my later decimal places are to the nearest uh, three points. 
but he, 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 he's right on that. No votes were 2,421, which is to say 2.9%. There was spoilt ballot papers numbering 51. Lord, as your Lordships know, Mr Justice Swift, at, at the invitation of Mr Carr and his uh, submissions, held that what happened here was a subversion of the postal ballot by the Union's encouragement to members to take their own ballot papers from the frames and fill them in then and there. For those that worked in sorting centres, of course it didn't apply in mail distribution centres where there are no frames and no post is, is distributed. And Mr Carr uh, also says, and Mr Justice Swift upheld his submission, that that led to non-secret voting. Now the evidence of that is contained... or can be summarised from the appendix to Mr Carr's uh, skeleton. If I could invite you to take that up, it's at page 18, uh, sorry, 19. He has an Annex 1, which is an analysis of the video uh, evidence. And if I go through e each one, one by one, in relation to those who didn't cast their vote secretly, he points out in slide 2 at Stockton, of the 232 members at site, over 50 are filmed in the, in the video at a gate meeting. No one, it is suggested, voted other than secretly. In slide 3, of 400 and slide, slide two is before they'd received their ballot papers, isn't it? Uh, the, the gate meeting. I think it is, my lord, yes. So slide three is at Swansea in the canteen. Your lordship will remember there are two uh, films of the Swansea canteen. <coughs> Both nearly consecutive by the look of it. And there, there are said to be 32 people in the video, we don't agree, we don't disagree with that uh, figure, of 425 members across the sites, and it's said that there are nine people clearly vis visible filling in a, their ballot papers. Well, what they're filling in is not entirely clear, but I'm not going to dispute uh, nine people for the... Uh, uh, for, for the purposes of this appeal. So let's say there were nine people visible, that means voting non-secretly at that site. That's just captured on the film. That's captured on the film. Uh, slide four is also at Swansea and there it said there are three people with ballot papers open and visible it says possibly voting, less clear than in the previous vi uh, video. We don't see anybody voting in, in that film. In slide 5, it said there are 117 people in the v video, all of which are voting. In, in fact, that's, uh, I think, a, a typographical error, because none of them are voting in that film. What they're doing is posting completed ballot envelopes. So presumably they have voted, but it doesn't show anybody actually voting. That's the rainbow post box, isn't it? Uh, that, that is, my lord, yes. Slide six is South Midlands, and there it said that of the 978 members across the site, two people are seen visibly voting, in other words, voting non-secretly. And in slide 7, at South Midlands, again, uh, another person is voting uh, visibly. 
Now the other slides or films show people uh, mostly posting letters. The only one that merits comment is slide 11 at Leeds and Pontefract where it said around eight people are voting explicitly in pictures within the video. Now these are still pictures. Now whether the individuals are posing with a completed ballot paper or whether they're actually casting their vote is difficult to say. But let's say there are eight people there. The consequence of that, if one adds up those figures, is that uh, eight and uh, three and nine uh, comes to 20 people who are said to be filmed not casting their vote secretly. Now 20 people in an electorate of 110,292 is 0.018% of the electorate. Of the voters, 83,704 of them, it represents 0.024%. It is, in short, insignificant and could have had no bearing on the ballot uh, whatever. Lord, I said that there were two other ballots, and Lord, I can. Lord, um, uh, apologies for interrupting Lord Hendy. In course of his submissions. I'm just anxious that the court's not led astray by thinking that that is the entirety of the evidence on which we rely to evidence uh, voting having taken place other than in secret. There's a second uh, annex to my submissions, Annex 2, and you'll see at item 3 on Annex 2, page 23 of the uh, submission that there are a raft of other photographs which we would suggest indicates Open, but open voting taking place in the workplace. So I just wanted to clarify that before one was left with the impression that uh, Mr. That Lord Hendy seeks to create with his statistical analysis. All right, thank you. We accept entirely that there are photographs of people holding up their uh, a completed uh, ballot paper. That's not quite the same as casting one's vote in uh, in secret. Lord, I tell your lordships about the, the other ballots. They were they concerned disputes in Parcel Force, which is an entity within the Royal Mail Group, not as yet a separate company. Part of the trade dispute is whether they it should become a separate company or not. But at the moment, it's just a section of the Royal Mail Group uh, organisation and employees. The first ballot in Parcel Force had an electorate of 4,217. Of those, 2,841 voted, which is a 67% turnout. Of those, 2,697 voted in favour of industrial action. That's a 95% majority. In the second ballot at Parcel Force, the electorate was the same, 4,217. 2,928 voted, which is a turnout of 69.4%. And of those, 2,770 voted yes, which is a majority of 94.7%. Did you say those ran over um, exactly the same dates? Exactly the same dates, my lord. So that if you were a uh, CWU member in Parcel Force, you would have got three ballot papers for each of the three disputes. But of course they were kept separate and separately counted and so on. Lord, in relation to those disputes... Well, I see. I see. Are the, the 4,217 electors who were within Parcel Force, they also voted in the... They did. I think they did, yes. Okay. Lord, they, they were two discrete ballots. The, the Parcel Force ballots, first of all, was one about a Tupi transfer. The second ballot was in identical form to the Royal Mail ballot. So the Parcel Force workers never got three. 
they got two. They got but two. One yes. of them was I, in identical. Mr. Carr's form. absolutely right. I, my recollection's at four. Absolutely right. So the second, the second figures that you gave us for parcel force were for the same dispute as we're concerned with. That, that, that's right, my lord. So the, the, the electorate, the 4,217, is a, is a different electorate. Yes, thank you. But it, what's significant about that, and I suppose not too much can be drawn from it, but the fact is that in relation to parcel force, there was no interception of envelopes. There's no allegation of a lack of secrecy in filling in ballot papers. So far as we're aware, there have been no complaints at all by the employer or anybody else in relation to the conduct of those ballots. But what is striking is that both the turnout and the majorities are not so very different to the primary dispute with which your lordships are concerned. And my lord, Mr. Brittenden has prepared, because we overlooked it, uh, in the flurry of activity leading to this hearing, a short chronology. Have you, have you seen that, Bruce? I have, yeah. Uh, I wonder if I may hand three copies up, or are they out the way? Sorry? See there, printed on both sides. So there's three of them there. Thank you. So, my lord, there's not a lot of significance in the chronology. There was a dispute in 2017. Uh, and then there was the dispute over whether the agreement which was then reached was being followed. There was mediation in uh, 2018, uh, and then one doesn't need the background to this. But in, on the 17th of October 2019, the union sent, uh, gave notice of intention to ballot for industrial action. Samples of the ballot... Uh, notice were provided. The ballot opened on the 24th of October. Ballot papers were received by post on the 25th of October and most of the films are, that your Lordships have seen were taken on the 25th of October. I think some might have been taken on the 26th. But September. September. Uh, September, yeah. We, we've got the month wrong, yeah. It should be good. Or should all be uh, September. So the sorry so the ballot opened on the 24th of September ballot papers received on the 25th of September ballot closes on the 15th of October uh, and then there's a scrutineers report and the proceedings and so on so we haven't we haven't seen the scrutineers report and we probably don't need to but does it address at all the no, issue it, with which it's, we're it was completely satisfied there's no no issues arose at all but it did, I mean, it didn't say we've heard about the interception and we're not bothered. Um, it, just no, didn't, it just didn't address it. It, it, it didn't, didn't deal with that. Yeah, okay. So the interception of the mail and the alleged lack of secrecy of balloting occurred on the 25th or at the latest the 26th of September. Now the significance of that is that we are now two months later. And we invite the court to infer that every piece of social media put out by the CWU in relation to that ballot has been examined by the respondent or those acting on its behalf. That every manager 
who could conceivably have given evidence of ballot irregularity of whatever kind has been interrogated. That every CCTV footage taken within Royal Mail establishments which could have shed any light on the ballot has been poured over. And the significance of that is that what your Lordships have, have in front of you is the totality of the evidence of alleged irregularity. There is no basis on which to infer that an irregularity of any kind was multiplied uh, el elsewhere. The fact of the matter is that in this case the workforce has expressed an overwhelming democratic mandate to exercise their fundamental human right to take industrial action and the employer seeks to circumvent this democratic mandate not on the grounds that the ballot has been rigged or might have been rigged or that members have been denied the right to vote who should have had it or that persons voted who had no entitlement to do so or that members have been intimidated or coerced into voting or not voting or voting a particular way or that voting pa papers have been mislaid or abstracted or not counted or fake votes have been added or any other perversion of democracy. There is nothing to suggest that this overwhelming democratic mandate does not genuinely represent the wishes of this workforce. I should add, my lords, that no member has complained that she or he didn't receive a ballot paper or had been pressured to vote yes instead of no or pressured to vote when he or she didn't wish to do so or that his or her ballot paper had not been counted or that he or she had been subjected to interference or coercion. In fact, so far as is known, no member has complained of anything about this ballot. Not to the independent scrutineer, not to the union, not to the employer. In our respectful submission, this was a fair, democratic ballot precisely reflecting the mandate of the membership. Lord, the employer's complaints are essentially threefold. One is that though each member was sent his or her ballot paper by post, some, with the encouragement of the union, took them from the delivery office frame before they were delivered to their homes. Secondly, is there any evidence as to the number of those who did that? So you, say, you say some. Mr Carr says thousands, but I'm not sure where he gets that from. No. He'll tell us no doubt in due course, but I just wonder if there's any evidence about it. So far as I'm aware, there is no evidence of it. And one, one of the, the queries I had was how many people worked in sorting offices and how many uh, worked in other establishments which, where there were no uh, sorting of, of mail. We know that delivery centres don't sort mail, so the members there, of which, in, in the, uh, as your Lordship saw, there were hundreds in uh, South Midlands, had no access to their, their envelopes before they received them at home. Yes. 
So the, the numbers are, are simply not known. It's a fair inference that there would be quite a lot, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. I mean, the union, not. The people want to support the union and they will often... Of go. course, of course. I accept that and, and uh, I, I also accept that the encouragement was, was broadly to members at sorting centres to do this. So that's the first complaint. The second is that by that encouragement, the union created the circumstances in which people voted at work. And thirdly, it said that some voted publicly and not in secret. And it's on that basis that breaches of section 230 are alleged and were uh, found by Mr Justice uh, Swift. We say that it would bring the law into disrepute if that if those alleged irregularities were su sufficient to overturn such a massive exercise in uh, democracy. Lord, uh, my Lord, Lord Justice Mayles asked me if the uh, Scrutineer's report is available. My assiduous junior has found it in the bundle. It's at page 11 of the exhibits which are in the supplementary bundle at divider three. No, it's not. Divider one. What page of the bundle is that, please? Uh, this is the supplementary bundle, divider one, page 11. That's just an email. I don't have the report. Or is that the report? That, that is the report. Oh, that is the report. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. At this point, I was going to turn to our submissions uh, in the as per the skeleton. Yes. But I just wonder whether it'd be more convenient to deal with the question of um, the additional evidence now and get that out of the way before I come to that. Yes. Uh, so, I'm sorry. Yes. I think we're minded, sorry to um, steal your thunder, Mr. Brittenden, to um, allow the additional evidence um, on both sides. Well, we've certainly got no objection to my learned friend's evidence. I don't know whether he wishes to say anything about that. I, think, I thought yours was contingent, and therefore you didn't mind uh, as long as you got your reply. Is that. Um... Uh, I wouldn't put it quite that way. Ah, all right. Uh... <laughs> oh, well, perhaps I spoke too soon then. <laughs> well, we, we did raise some objections to the difficulty that the union put forward in relation to these witness statements. One of them was from somebody who prepared a witness statement for the first hearing, so the idea that that individual could not be identified seems somewhat far-fetched. The second one uh, from Mr Williams himself, well, Mr Williams posted the video on his uh, Facebook page, so again, the idea that he couldn't be identified um, we find rather problematic if that's the basis upon which the evidence is being put in. But well, Mr Carr, given the, the nature of these exercises, interlocutory injunctions, things don't get organised as well as they might. Well, Shouldn't be let it in would, unless there's strong reason not you, to. You will have detected from the way in which I put my submissions that I'm setting out those objections, but I'm not going to die in a ditch over them, uh, unlike our future Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, well, uh, we'll allow the evidence then. I'm well, very grateful. Um, Mr. Brittenden will be sorry to have missed the opportunity to address your lordships. 
Well, I, I was then going to turn to the uh, authorities and the uh, our skeleton. We'll do, in, in our skeleton, if your lordships have it in the core bundle, it's at page 19 of that bundle. If your lordships have got it separately, it's, at, it's page 4, uh, where we have the heading, the legal framework. And at paragraph 9, we draw attention to the judgment of this court given by my lord Sir Patrick Elias in the Serco case. And if I may, uh, I'm going to invite your lordships to look at that case. In the bundle of authorities, it's tab 17. Yes. issues in that case were whether the union had balloted the right uh, people and there were uh, a small number of uh, members in, in issue. The facts really don't need to go any further. It is not a case on section 230. But my Lord Sir Patrick uh, took the opportunity <coughs> in paragraphs 24 to 30 to set out the general framework of the legislation. Lord, I, I don't propose to read from that, but it's a, I should imagine every Labour law student in the country is familiar with those paragraphs which uh, set out with the utmost clarity the way in which this part of the legislation uh, works. But I would draw your Lordship's attention in particular to paragraphs 13 and 14 which say something about the approach of the, the, the court to take. Under the heading of in, injunctions, uh, my Lord says at paragraph uh, 13, well, perhaps I should take it from paragraph 12. So the courts have recognised that in disputes of this nature, it's incumbent on them to have regard to the underlying merits of the claim. That's the reference to section 2212. And in practice, that involves considering whether the union will be likely to be able to establish at trial that the immunities are applicable, NWL and Woods. Section 221 now encapsulates this principle, provides that, and then it sets it, sets it out. So if the appeals succeed, the injunctions ought to be discharged in that case. It doesn't follow that, as a matter of law, the interim injunction has to be refused if the court finds that it's more likely than not that the union will succeed at trial in showing that the immunities will apply. However, it will have to be a very exceptional case indeed for that not to be the consequence. See NWL and Dimbleby. It's not suggested that either of these cases falls into that exceptional category. The role of this court on an appeal from the grant or refusal of an interim injunction described by Lord Diplock in Hadmore Productions and Hamilton. That case was concerned with the question whether, in its discretion, the court ought to have granted an injunction. Justice Dillon held that even if, contrary to his view, the union was not likely to establish a trade dispute defence, nonetheless there was no purpose in granting the injunction on the particular facts of the case. The Court of Appeal took a different view. Lord D Diplock said that it was not for the Court of Appeal simply to substitute its view for that of the first instance judge. The function is one of review, and in the absence of further material evidence in validating the exercise of discretion by the first instance judge, the Court of Appeal should only interfere where the judge had misdirected himself or reached a conclusion which is unsustainable on the evidence before him. Mr Bayar submits, and I accept, that this means that we shouldn't interfere with the decision of the judge below unless we are satisfied that the judge's assessment of the likelihood of the trade dispute defence succeeding was plainly uh, wrong. And we, of course, invite your lordships to adopt that approach in the instant case to find that the judge's assessment of the likelihood of our de defence is wrong and therefore uh, discharge the injunction. Lord, I appreciate I'm not reading this in the order in which my Lord set it out in his judgment, but can I invite your Lordships now to go back to paragraphs 8 and 9, 
which say something more about the uh, uh, international law background and indeed the domestic law background to the approach that a court ought to take. Uh, in paragraph 8, my Lord says, although the common law recognises no right to strike, there are various international instruments that do. See, for example, Article 6 of the Council of Europe Social Charter and the International Labour Organisation Conventions 98 and 151. Furthermore, the European Convention on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms has in a number of cases confirmed that the right to strike is conferred as an element of the right to freedom of association conferred by Article 11.1 of the Convention, which in turn is given effect by the Human Rights Act 1998. The right is not unlimited and may be justifiably restricted under Article 11.2. Council for the two unions contends that the detailed complexity of the balloting provisions and their unnecessary intrusion into the union's processes involves a disproportionate interference with the Article 11.1 right. He accepts, however, that as far as this court is concerned, the issue has been settled against him by the decision of the court in Metrobus, although there have been certain developments in the European court in particular since Metrobus, he accepts that following the observations of Lord Bingham in K, it wouldn't be appropriate to seek to revisit that question at this level. However, he reserves the right to challenge Metrobus should this case go further. There is one respect, however, in which I think that the recognition of a right to strike does have a bearing on the issues before us. Mr Bayer, Counsel for the Employers submitted that, since the unions were seeking to take advantage of an immunity, the legislation should be construed strictly against them. There's undoubtedly some authority to support that submission. See, for example, Lord Denning in Express Newspapers. But I don't think that is a sustainable argument today. The common law's focus on the protection of property and contractual rights is necessarily antithetical to any form of industrial action, since... The purpose of the action is to interfere with the employer's rights. The statutory immunities are simply the form which the law in this country takes to carve out the ability for unions to take lawful strike action. It's for Parliament to determine how the conflicting interests of employers and unions should be reconciled in the field of industrial relations. But if one starts from the premise that the legislation should be strictly construed against those seeking the benefit of the immunities, the effect is the same as it would be if there were a presumption that Parliament intends that the interests of employers should hold sway unless the legislation clearly dictates otherwise. I don't think this is now a legitimate approach if it ever was. In my judgment, the legislation should simply be construed in the normal way without presumptions one way or the other. Indeed, as far as the 1992 Act is concerned, the starting point is that it should be given a likely and workable construction, as Lord Bingham put it in National Association of Schoolmasters. So, my Lord, my Lords, that, that uh, we respectfully submit, and Mr Card, I think, doesn't submit otherwise, is the approach that the court should take. Uh, there is one further passage which... Uh, uh, is relevant to a submission I'll make in due course on de minimis and so on and that is at paragraph 81 of my Lord's judgment at page 869 of the report uh, and I'll pick it up from paragraph 79 if I may because it will save referring to some other authorities. Uh, at 79 it says, Hendy submits the de minimis principle as a well-established principle in English law, unjust to invalidate the whole process merely because the union wrongly identified two out of more than 600 members who it understood to fall within the balloting constituents. He relied on a number of authorities in support of his argument. First in RJB Mining, Mr Justice Morris Casey then was said it is well understood that a union is not expected to achieve 100% perfection in the conduct of ballots such as these. A union has the protection of the de minimis rule and the test of reasonable practicability. See British Railways Board and NUR. In that case, Lord Donaldson, the Master of the Rolls, with whose judgment uh, 
Lord and Lady Justice Butler Sloss and Stuart Smith agreed, said that by de minimis he meant trifling errors which should not be allowed to form a basis for invalidating the ballot. Henry also relies on the fact that in Metrobus, Lord Justice Lloyd observed in the context of that case, Obiter, that an error in the information given to the employer about check-off employees when it was stated to be 788 rather than 778 would not have been fatal to the notice. Although it's right to say that the error was with respect to information which strictly didn't need to be supplied at all. Mr Bayar submits that the RJB case was before the amendments to the balloting provisions and in particular the implementation of section 232B. Moreover, he emphasises that in a white paper setting out the government response to consultations about possible amendments to these provisions, the government stated in terms that it didn't think it necessary to introduce the equivalent of a section 232B defence, which the government termed a disregard, with respect to the notification provisions. Mr Bayar also relies on certain observations of the members of the Court of Appeal in British Airways and Unite. In that case, the issue was whether the Union had complied with the statutory obligation in Section 231 to inform members of the result of the ballot in circumstances where they had not communicated directly with the members but had instead placed the results on Union websites and other Union notice boards court held by a majority that this constituted compliance with the section. One of the issues before the court was whether, even if it had not been, the court could adopt a principle of substantial compliance or apply the de minimis principle and conclude on that basis that the ballot result should not be invalidated. The Lord Chief Justice gave a somewhat elliptical response and the Master of the Rolls commented that whilst common sense might suggest that there should be a role for the de minimis principle, that has its problems in light of the wording of the sections. Lady Justice Smith, however, felt no difficulty in concluding that the principle was applicable. Uh, and she said, I would accept Henry's submission that if there were failures, they were not of a serious nature. If the union didn't comply completely with section 231, it appears to me very likely that the judge at trial would hold that there had been substantial compliance. Is substantial compliance sufficient? Section uh, so-and-so provides that industrial action shall be set regarded as having the support of a ballot if the various conditions are satisfied. One of the conditions is that requirements of Section 231 are satisfied. So Section 231 is a condition precedent to the validity of the balloting process. So equally, uh, I enter to say that section 230 is. However, I have already said that the section requires the union only to take such steps as a reasonable and prudent person would consider necessary to ensure that the information reached those entitled. I've already noted that minor and inconsequential infringements of the balloting requirements can be disregarded. I can't believe that Parliament was content to disregard minor accidental infringements of the balloting provisions and yet intend that minor and inconsequential infringements of Section 231 should have the effect of invalidating the ballot. I consider that the policy of this part of the Act is not to create a series of traps or hurdles for the Union to negotiate, it's to ensure fair dealing between the employer and union and to ensure a fair, open and democratic ballot. I can see that if there's an infringement which affects some aspect of those important policy requirements, the ballot must be held invalid. But in my view, it can't have been Parliament's intention to allow a minor infringement which has had no adverse effect on anyone's rights or interests to invalidate the ballot. In my view, substantial compliance with Section 231 will satisfy Section 226A2. If it were not so, the rights of workers to withhold their labour would be seriously undermined. In considering this question, I'd start from the observation of Lord Bingham in the National Association of Schoolmasters case. It would be absurd if an immaterial and accidental failure to send a ballot paper to a single member were to invalidate the ballot so as to deprive the union of immunity 
and this contingency is provided for by the, the various sections. But it will be equally absurd if an immaterial and accidental failure to establish with accuracy who was entitled to vote were to invalid the, validate the ballot so as to deprive the Union of immunity. Lord Bingham was dealing with failings in the ballot itself, but as Lady Justice Smith pointed out, it would have been it would be even more absurd if accidentally depriving someone of the opportunity to vote could be remedied, but failing to include them in the relevant notice could not. It's the same error which lies at the root of both breaches. If that were to be the position, it would largely emasculate the defence which Section 232B is intended to provide. Are the courts compelled to accept that this is the consequence of Section 232B being limited in the way it is? I do not accept that they are. The government may have been unwilling to introduce an equivalent to Section 232B to deal with notification requirements. One can see why it is not altogether appropriate since a failure to notify will never have an adverse effect on the result. But I can see no justification for reading uh, the section as being intended to cut back on such defences as the law would have allowed before it was implemented. It's providing a potentially wider defence than the exception for trifling errors would admit. I see no reason why the British Railways Board case should not continue to lay down the law in areas where there's no express statutory defence and every reason to suppose that Parliament would not have intended to have affect such defences. It may be that there's a distinction between the concept of substantive compliance referred to by Lady Justice Smith and the de minimis principle. The former may be wider in scope than the latter and rest on assumed parliamentary intention. But we heard no argument about that. Hendy put his case on the de minimis exception and that's as far as he needs go. In my judgment, whatever the justification for applying the principle of substantial compliance, and I find Lady Justice analysis, Lady Justice Smith's analysis very persuasive, I am satisfied that the doctrine of de minimis at least is available to the Union and would apply in the circumstances of this case. It follows that I consider that the judge erred in law in rejecting the application of that uh, doctrine. Lord, your Lordships, I hope, will forgive me for reading so extensively from that case, but so many of those uh, uh, passages bear on the issues before your Lordships today. No, we understand that, and um, forgive me, I should have um, uh, invited you to save your voice and um, tell us what passages you want to read, if there are other long passages that... Uh, I'm grateful, Lord. So, Lord, those... Turning back to our skeleton argument, we've, we've taken a, a, a shortcut to some of those uh, passages, which I need uh, now trouble you with, but for your Lordship's note, the case at the bottom of um, page four of the skeleton, the Lady Justice Smith in British Airways, that's at tab 15 of the bundle, should your Lordship's need uh, to go there. And further down the next page, under the heading of substantial compliance and de minimis, the reference to RJB mining is at tab 7. And having read the extract in the Serco judgment, I won't take your lordship to that, tab uh, 7. Uh, and there's further citation from my lord uh, Sir Patrick's a judgment. Uh, towards the end of that section. Lord, at page 21 we deal with cyanamide in section 221 and I've really dealt with uh, that. So we come to section 230. Your Lordships have looked at the words of the uh, section. Uh, and we make the observation that the obligations in 23, 231b, 232... 234A are all qualified by reference to reasonable practicability, which is, was said to be qualifying words, and there is uh, something in Balfour BT Engineering Services and Unite, which is at tab 18, which I invite your Lordships to take up briefly in the judgment of Mr Justice Eady. That's tab 18 of the bundle of authorities. The 
the issue once again was a was a different one relating to uh, sec it was relating to do sec to section 30 but not on the points raised here and at paragraph 34 if I may I'll read the whole of that which is at page 832 of the law report Mr Justice Ely says where the balance should fall depends to an extent on the facts of the particular case obviously not right to regard the Serco case as suggesting in general terms that the appropriate standard of democratic legitimacy can be achieved merely by doing one's incompetent best or being lax about taking proper steps to obtain the most up-to-date information available. Nevertheless, it is right to pay due regard to the policy reflected in that judgment and the relatively relaxed interpretation which, it seems, the legislature intended the courts to apply. While reasonable practicability clearly introduces an objective test, there would need to be room for union officers to exercise their own judgment about what are the appropriate steps to take in a given situation. It can't be right for a judge to hold that all reasonably practicable steps have not been taken, merely because he or she would, as an outsider, have done something different. There must be leeway permitted for those who are familiar with the membership and with their union's particular problems of record keeping to take their own course in making genuine attempts to achieve the standards required of them by the legislature. In any event, the wording of the statute doesn't go so far as to impose on the union a positive duty to take all steps that are reasonably uh, practical. practical. And there's one other passage while we have that report open, and it's at paragraph 39 on the following page. Again, addressing the minor and accidental um, infringements unlikely to affect the result section, section 232B. He says at paragraph 39, so insofar as I need to address that section, I would have to consider whether any failures were accidental and unlikely to affect the outcome of the ballots. As far as I can see, accidental in this context means no more than unintentional. Don't understand the word to be connoting some extraneous occurrence outside the control of the union, as it may sometimes imply. Believe that to be consistent with the interpretation in Serco, having regard to the history I've recited, it seems clear that any such failures would be unintentional. And so that, that's the test under that section. Does that arise in our case because the union clearly intended to do what it did? Yes. Um, just a question whether that amounts to interference and so forth. Yes. I think it, I think it said that the union could have t done more to protect the secrecy of uh, voting and didn't do enough so that it may be relevant there. But they certainly didn't necessarily intend there to be a breach of the secret a, a, a balloting provision. Yes, I see it may arise on yes. uh, that particular subsection. Lord, we do address briefly the issue under the European Court of Human uh, Rights. Uh, we make reference in particular uh, to the common law uh, in Crofter Hand Woven Harris Tweed and Veach in 1942. Lord, I'm not going to trouble your lordships to go to that. Uh, it's for your lordships to note it's tab three, and the quotation is at page 463 and runs on to 464. But it, it suggests that there is in fact a common law uh, right to strike, but that's not really the issue here because we accept that however that right is framed it must be a constrained by the conditions imposed by the legislation. Lord, we, we mentioned the European Court of uh, Human Rights and we set out Article 11 over the page. The fact of there being a right to strike we don't think is disputed it's not an unlimited right to strike, obviously. Uh, we cite a number of cases there 
from the European Court of Human Rights which reiterate the right to strike, one of which we've put in the bundle, Mr Carr, I think, put in the bundle. It's the RMT and UK case. Lord, again, I'm not going to uh, take your Lordships to it. It's tab 20 for your Lordships note. And if your Lordships were going to look at it, paragraph 87 is, is, re is also relevant as well as uh, 84. Lord, um, we turn then to the, a general question of uh, statutory construction and the, before we get to our submissions on section 230 in this case. And we do draw attention to Dewport, Steels and Sirs. And there's quite a long passage in, in that on which we rely and which was mentioned by Mr Justice Swift in his judgment. Lord, it's tab four of the authorities House of Lords decision in 1980. And the passage to which we draw attention, we put in a short quotation, but the passage which I invite your Lordships to look at is a bit longer, from 177 to 178. Right, show me that to ourselves. Lords, if you were kind enough to read it to yourselves, it's the passage which begins just below letter A at 177, beginning that conclusion uh, right through to between E and F at 178. Yes, all right. I'm very grateful, my Lord. Right. Thank you. Lord, um, the, the second part of our uh, submissions as to the approach to uh, construction of, the le of uh, legislation is in paragraph 25 of our skeleton argument at page 9. But before I come to address uh, just a couple of those uh, cases, I want to explain why uh, we're raising this issue at all. And the reason is that my learned friend invites the court to infer from the fact that two, section 230 was amended to remove the possibility of workplace industrial ballots that allowing a ballot 
to take place to any extent at the workplace is now impermissible. So can I just show your lordship the lordships the provision as it then was, so your lordship can see what the extent of the amendment uh, to it was. Well, we we've set it out uh, verbatim in our skeleton, which is as convenient a place I think to see it. Uh, if your lordships look at our page 16, page 31 of the bundle, in paragraph 46. So the original wording of section 233 uh, uh, provided this, that so far as is reasonable, every person who is entitled to vote in the ballot must be supplied with a voting paper or have one made available to him immediately before, immediately after, or during his working hours, at his place of work, or at a place which is more convenient for him. So far as is reasonably practical, every person who is entitled to vote in the ballot must be given either a, a convenient opportunity to vote by post or an opportunity to vote immediately before, immediately after or during his working hours at his place of work or at a place which is more convenient for him or as alternatives, both of those opportunities. No opportunity to vote shall be given except as mentioned before. So originally, one could have the... Uh, the so originally, the voting papers had to be made available at work, and then there was a choice as to whether the voting uh, was to be uh, facilitated at work or an opportunity to vote by post was to be given. Section 230 was then amended in 1993 to read as your lordships have it now, which contains no provision for ballot papers to be made available at work and no provision for an opportunity to vote before, after or during working hours at the place of work. So the question is whether that change to the legislation has the effect which my learned friend submits to your Lordships and Mr Justice Swift appeared to find, namely that in, in, inviting or encouraging uh, workers to vote, to exercise their vote, albeit one where the ballot paper had got to them by post and they were posting it back. They did it at work, was that in breach of section 230. And it's in relation to that submission that we draw attention to the cases on page 9 of our written sub submissions. Um, we've set it out there in non-chronological -chron order, so I'm going to deal with it in chronological order. The first case I want to draw attention to is Inco Europe in the Court of Appeal, which your Lordships have at tab 8 of the bundle. This was a, a, a commercial contract, and the question was whether the uh, jurisdiction of the courts was excluded by uh, arbitration uh, uh, provisions and there had obviously been a, an error in the drafting. Lord, at, at, um, well, I've got the uh, uh, different report. Let me just find where I've marked it. I'm very grateful, my lady. Yes, it's at two, 272, just below letter D. Number of arguments advanced on behalf of Steinweg. The argument which needs to be considered is that which arises from an examination and consideration of the provisions of the Act itself. Gavar uh, submits that when this task is undertaken, be seen that what may be termed the literal construction of the amended Act of 1981 doesn't accord with the statutory intention disclosed by the Act of 1996, and that the better view is the intention of the 1996 Act is that the previously existing right of appeal with leave to the Court of Appeal, respective decisions and applications for the stay of litigation, has not been taken away by the Act of 96. In general terms, it's undoubtedly correct that the effect of an amendment to a statute should be ascertained by construing the amended statute. Thus, what is to be looked at 
is the amended statute itself as if it were a street freestanding piece of le legislation and its meaning and effect ascertained by examination of the language of the, that statute. However, in certain circumstances, it may well be necessary to look at the amending statute as well. This involves no infringement of the principles of statutory inter interpretation. Indeed, it's an affirmation of them. The expression of the relevant parliamentary intention is the amending act. It's the amending act which is the operative provision which alters the law from that which it had been before. So the, the general proposition is that you look at the statute as amended without looking at the uh, amending leg legislation, but there may be circumstances in which you should uh, do so. And that was the case in this uh, particular instance, and we can see that in the House of Lords, which is at tab 9, where Lord Nichols uh, says at page 592, that uh, drafting errors may be corrected. And if I pick it up uh, just above letter uh, D, uh, some examples of the correction of drafting errors, some notable instances are given in uh, Sir Rupert Cross's admirable opuscule statutory interpretation in omitting or inserting words the judge isn't really engaged in a hypothetical reconstruction of the intention of the drafter or the legislature, but is simply making as much sense as he can of the text of the statutory provision read in its appropriate context and within the limits of the judicial role. This power is confined to plain cases of drafting mistakes. Courts are ever mindful that their constitutional role in this field is interpretive. They must abstain from any course which might have the appearance of judicial legislation. Statute is expressed in language approved and enacted by the legislature. So the courts exercise considerable caution before acting or omitting or substituting words. Before interpreting a statute in this way, the court must be abundantly sure of three matters. One, intended purpose of the statute uh, in question. Two, that by inadvertence the draftsman and Parliament failed to give effect to that purpose in the provision in question. And three, the substance of the provision Parliament would have made, though not necessarily the precise words Parliament would have used, had the error in the bill been uh, no noticed. So those are circumstances in which the, the strict wording, the literal wording of the statute uh, uh, can be... Uh, changed by uh, the uh, court. Well, the only other case I was going to draw your lordship's attention to is the case of Brown, which is a Supreme Court case at tab 19. Out. And this is rather a, the converse situation to that which a, a might arise in our case. His Lordship says it would be a curious, indeed anomalous outcome of the removal of the defence from sections 5 and 6 that it should be implied into section 4 to which it had not previously applied. At a technical or theoretical level, it can be argued that such a result is feasible because, as the appellant has submitted, the acts are to be construed as a whole in their amended form. Bennion describes the effect of textual amendment of the statute as follows. Under modern practice, the intention of Parliament when effecting textual amendment of an act is usually to produce a revised text of the act, which is thereafter to be construed as a whole. Any repealed provisions to be treated as never having been there so far as concerns the application of the amended Act for the future. Original emphasis. The appellant has pointed out that in B, a minor, 
in deciding whether the presumption was rebutted, both Lord Nichols and Lord Stein had taken account of the amendment of the applicable maximum penalty from two to ten years imprisonment. And in Kumar, Court of Appeal construed section 12 of the Act in its present form with an amended statutory framework that included the Act of 1967 and amendments in 1994 and 2000, by virtue of which homosexual acts between consenting males of a prescribed age were decriminalised. It was suggested, therefore, that a new approach to the interpretation of Section 4 is now warranted. I can't accept that argument. In the first place, while the amended legislation is to be construed as a whole in its revised form, it doesn't follow that its antecedent history be left entirely out of account. More pertinently, the relevant amendment of the Act removed a defence which had previously been available for offences under sections 5 or 6 where none had existed for offences under section 4. To suggest that the removal of the defence of the defence would have the effect of introducing it under Section 4 by implication takes contrivance too far. I'm satisfied that in its statutory context, Section 4 must be interpreted as not requiring proof that the defendant didn't know or reasonably believe that the girl was aged over 14. So where a, a, a defence in a criminal a statute has been removed, oh, one might have thought that it was plain that a defendant couldn't rely on that, uh, that uh, defence as a matter of statutory uh, interpretation. But the situation in our case is different. Here there was a removal of a provision which expressly permitted uh, ballots to be distributed at the workplace and voting to take, out the, to, to take place at the workplace. Uh, and those provisions were uh, removed. And nothing is left in the statute to say anything about the place at which uh, voting is to take place. But uh, do you say that that antecedent history must be entirely left out of account? No, I, I, I can't say that, that it should be completely ignored. But, but when one remembers that that uh, amendment was made 23 years ago, it's, uh, we do say that it, it's not incumbent on a union to appreciate that the inference to be drawn is that Parliament was saying that ballot papers cannot be completed at work. After all, it's not even as if the statute says that ballot papers should be completed at home. The statute is silent as to where ballot papers are to be completed. And what happened in this case is we know not just that in sorting offices people brought their ballot papers in, but we know, uh, and Mr Carr pointed it out from the still photography, still photographs in his <coughs> Annex 2, that people brought ballot papers from home to work. Now whether they'd fill them in at home or at work, one simply doesn't know. There's still photographs. One doesn't know, but they, they brought, brought them in. And our point is that that statute has left it open without any restriction at all as to where the ballot papers are to be completed. And we draw the obvious realistic image of the member who goes to the local pub with his ballot paper because he knows his colleagues are going to be there and he enjoys a pint in the evenings and the ballot papers are completed there. I appreciate that doesn't answer the question on secrecy, but, but it does show that Parliament has, has not legislated to preclude ballot papers being completed anywhere other than work. Anywhere other than home, rather. I'm not sure that deals with uh, part of the case against you, though. I mean, clearly, um, any worker could fill out the ballot paper anywhere, and it would be quite absurd for Parliament to try and identify where they have to fill it in. Uh, unenforceable and, and uh, anonymous. That's not quite the same as saying, uh, can the union encourage them or take action which might interfere with the normal process, which is that it would go to their house and they would fit it out where they like, but it would be their choice, as it were. And, and the question I think you have to engage with is, is the encouragement, which amounts to a certain form of pressure, I'm not saying in itself improper, but 
is the encouragement such as can be said to amount to an interference with what would otherwise occur? Well, the question of interference is a different one. The word interference arises under section 231, and we've got submissions to make about that. So I wonder if, if my Lord, I, I could just park yes, that question Sorry, for a moment and, 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 uh, and come, come back to it. Lord, we've made some observations in our skeleton argument about the judgment of Mr. Justice Swift. We didn't then have the transcript that we've got now. The Lordships have read the judgment. I don't propose to develop that. So, can I then come to the submissions on section 230, look to all the case law so that it may, might be convenient for your Lordships and your Ladyship to have just have open the text of section 230 at tab one of the uh, bundle, I certainly found that I needed to look at it again and again and again uh, in the process of drafting with Mr. Britton and these submissions. So uh, we begin our uh, submissions on section 230 uh, by making observation about the purpose of section 230. And our submission is that the purpose was to ensure that every person entitled to vote could exercise that right freely and without improper interference or constraint by the union as to which way the voter voted or indeed whether the voter voted at all. And if that was the purpose, that purpose was fulfilled in this case. Because everybody, so far as is known, who was entitled to vote got a voting paper, and everybody who got a voting paper either voted or didn't vote, or voted yes or voted no, as they wished. So that in our respectful submission, the, the purpose uh, was fulfilled. Now, the more detailed provisions of Section 230 in uh, saying that there should be a ballot, uh, a fully uh, postal ballot, ballot, was in order to secure that fundamental purpose. There's no magic in voting by post otherwise. It was to give a, an additional protection to members so that they would not so that they would be able to exercise their right to vote without interference or constraint Lord my Lord on that uh, in our written submission, we pick up a phrase from Lady Justice Smith uh, about the uh, there not be, there being or not being an adverse effect on anyone's rights or uh, interests. So in our respectful submission, there was no adverse effect on anyone's rights or interests so far as the members' rights and interests were, were concerned. But neither was there in relation to the employer either. The, the requirement of a fair and democratic vote, of course, touch, touches the interests of employers, but primarily it's to ensure uh, democracy amongst the uh, members. Well, it, it, the... My learned friend has uh, adduced some evidence of parliamentary uh, intention and I would invite your Lordships to look at the green paper which led to this legislation. Lord, it's in the other tab of authorities which I think is called parliamentary materials. And at tab one... We have a green paper called Industrial Relations in the 1990s, 
which was published in 1991. If your Lordships look at the first page of the printout, which is page two of the uh, bundle, Mr. Carr's reproduced from section one of the green paper, amongst other things, paragraph 1.17. I draw attention to that. It was against this background, what the uh, Conservative governments had done from 1980 uh, onwards. So it was against this background that the government embarked on the process of a step-by-step -step reform of industrial relations law. The objectives have been threefold. One, to safeguard the democratic rights of trade union members within their unions. That's, that's the first objective. And then to establish a fair balance of bargaining power between employers and unions. And three, to protect employers and employees alike against abuses of trade union power, clothes shop, flying pickets, and, and so on. So safeguarding democratic rights of the trade union members is top of the pile. And then if your Lordship's looking 1.18, as a result of the trade union le legislation, just reached the statute book since 1980, all employers are free to decide whether or not to join a trade union. And the second bullet point, all union members have the right to vote in a secret ballot to elect their leaders and before they are called on to take industrial action. So again, it's the union members who are being protected uh, here. And then there are a number of um, other uh, provisions which I don't think are material. My friend has produced chapter two, which begins at page four of the bundle. And at page five, <coughs> under the heading strikes and other forms of industrial action, the Green Paper reads, it's generally acknowledged that one of the most important industrial relations reforms of the 1980s has been the statutory requirement for unions to hold strike ballots. The principle that union members should be able to decide for themselves whether to strike by voting in a secret ballot has always had widespread public support. Until the 1984 Act made it a condition of trade union immunity, such ballots were the exception rather than the rule. Nothing did more damage the reputation of British trade unionism than the spectacle of strike decisions being taken by a show of hands at rowdy factory gate or car park uh, meetings. Um, and that was a beneficial uh, change. So in 210, they say provisions have now been enforced for five years. Government believe it's right, particularly in light of recent strikes and threats, uh, set out uh, proposals for requiring, uh, first is notice, and the second is strike balance to be conducted by post in all cases, except where only a few employees are in, involved. Then um, at page six, one has the law on industrial action and ballots, and at 3.6, the Green Paper reads, it's not so long since members of some unions were called on to strike with no more than a pretense of consultation. For example, through votes taken by a show of hands at mass meetings, with all the scope for intimidation and misrepresentation that this involved. Even such wholly inadequate form of Forms of consultation were denied to some union members, and then it mentions the National Union of, of Mine Workers as an example of uh, a requirement for a ballot being ignored. And then over the page at 3.7, the fundamental purpose of the statutory requirements for unions to hold strike ballots is to guarantee the democratic rights of union members and thereby prevent the abuse of union power. So in our respectful submission, that, that is precisely what the purpose of Section 230 uh, is. Um, in 3.8, it says, uh, essential both employers and ordinary union members should have an effective remedy against unbalanced calls for industrial action. Trade unions' immunity from normal legal consequences is a privilege which should be available only if proper democratic procedures have followed. No reason why an employer should be left without a legal remedy if his business and the jobs of his employees are damaged, put at risk by a strike, which has not been put to the test of a secret ballot. 
Furthermore, a ballot which is to afford a union protection against legal proceedings must satisfy all the requirements which ensure that the ballot is properly conducted. All the union's members who will be called upon to strike must be entitled to vote. Union members must be able to cast their vote free from interference or intimidation by union officials or other union members, and their votes must be fairly and accurately counted. Employment Act enables a union member to bring court proceedings to restrain call which doesn't have the support of a proper secret uh, um, ballot. Um, then the case for further l legislation is set out at the bottom of the page um, and it deals, the first bullet point is strike notice, the second bullet point is this, provide additional safeguards for union members against fraud or intimidation and then giving employers rights to information. And in 3.15, the Green Paper reads, just as the 88 Act extended the original provisions of the 84 Act on union executive election ballots so as to require these to be held by postal voting and to be subject to independent scrutiny, government believes that it's now right, six years after the original strike ballot provisions became law, to consider similar <coughs> steps in respect of union industrial action ballot. The 84 Act made it easier for a union to conduct proper postal ballot before it calls for strike industrial action. A strike ballot will often affect union members more directly and may well be considered more important by members themselves than a union election ballot. Accordingly, the law should ensure that such ballots are conducted to the same sort of standards, including fully postal voting and independent uh, uh, scrutiny. Then the proposals are set out. First of all, strike notice and over the page postal balloting. Government proposed that an industrial action ballot should have uh, to be conducted by fully postal voting in every case with more than 50 members entitled. It's for further consideration whether semi postal balloting of voting papers made available at the workplace or some other more convenient location returned by post should be required. Um, that, of course, never came about. 322, government believed the proposed threshold uh, would cover situations of workplace balloting rather than postal may be appropriate in all other cases, however, fully postal but. Uh, voting provides a greater assurance that voting will be both secret and free from intimidation. And then there's provisions in relation to independent scrutiny, which found their form in the legislative uh, legislation, as your lordships uh, saw. And the conclusion is at the foot of the page. Government pro uh, believe the proposals in this chapter would help to secure the adoption of good practice in connection with the con conduct of union industrial action ballots. This would enhance union members' democratic rights, promote orderly and responsible handling of industrial disputes, and help protect businesses, jobs, and community from irresponsible industrial action. So your lordships gather from that that the, the mischief of workplace balloting is not simply that the ballots were cast at vote, uh, were cast at work, but because of the fear of that the ballot wouldn't reflect the true wishes of the uh, members and because of the fear of intimidation or fraud or coercion and that these reforms were directed in the first place to protect the democratic rights of union members. Although employers were also given a right to take uh, legal action, if the as well as the members, if the provisions were uh, breached. So we, in our respectful submission, that that's it's important to see that purpose, because in this case, in our respectful submission, that kind of uh, intimidation, fraud, coercion, or inaccurate counting of, of votes is not raised even as an allegation. There is no suggestion on the evidence or in submissions that the overwhelming 
vote in favour of industrial action was anything other than a true and accurate reflection of the wishes of the membership. No suggestion that the rights of any member had been infringed. Lord, we mention Article 11 there, which my Lord Sir Patrick Elias dealt with in the Serco uh, judgment, and don't develop it any further. The infringements have, have got, uh, the restrictions on the right to strike have to be prescribed by law and necessary in a democratic uh, society for, amongst other things, the protections of rights and freedoms of others. And we cite the case of Chassagnu in, uh, uh, at the bottom of that page. I'll take your lordships there very briefly, if I may. It's tab 10 of the authorities. A very different factual situation. This was compulsory requirement on the owners of land to permit hunting rights to be given to an approved municipal hunters association. But what is said at page 34 of the printout at paragraph 113 by the European Court of Human Rights is this. In the present case, the only aim invoked by the government to justify the interference complained of was the protection of rights and freedoms of others. Where these rights and freedoms are themselves amongst those guaranteed by the Convention or its protocols, it must be accepted that the need to protect them may lead states to restrict other rights or freedoms likewise set forth in the Convention. It's precisely this constant search for a balance between the fundamental rights of each individual which constitutes the foundation of a democratic society. The balancing of individual interests that may well be contradictory is a difficult matter and contracting states must have a broad margin of appreciation in this respect since the national authorities are in principle better placed than the European court to assess whether or not there's a pressing social need capable of justifying interference with one of the rights guaranteed by the Convention. It's a different matter where restrictions are imposed on a right or freedom guaranteed by the Convention in order to protect the rights and freedoms not as such enunciated therein. In such a case, only indisputable imperatives can justify interference with enjoyment of a Convention right. In the present case, the government pleaded the need to protect or encourage democratic participation in hunting. Even supposing that French law enshrines a right or freedom to hunt, the court notes, like the Bordeaux Administrative Court, that such a right or freedom is not one of those set forth in the Convention, which does, however, expressly guarantee freedom of, of association. So the test is indisputable imperative to justify a restriction of the uh, right to, uh, to strike. Now, so far as the employer is concerned, in seeking to impose the restriction of an injunction on the CWU, in our respectful submission, it can't possibly point to an indisputable imperative that that has to happen. It might be otherwise, I accept, that if a number of members of the CWU complain that they hadn't been given the right to exercise their vote or had been intimidated to vote in a particular way, they would uh, certainly um, be entitled to uh, uh, invoke the uh, convention. Might an employer not be relying on Article 1, Protocol 1 rights? Yes, it might, it might be. It doesn't that engage a balancing act then? Well, it, it depends. Um, Article 1, uh, Protocol 1 uh, is, is the right to a possession. I mean, uh, and the question is re whether that would extend to the right... Uh, to operate yes. the workplace without strikes. It, it, yes, yes. And that's, it, it's an interference with the, with the running of his business. 
this yes. separation. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm, yes, I, for, for, the, for the purposes of this argument, I'm going to accept that because I don't want to be uh, drawn down the path of developing further art, art, Article 11 beyond stating that there is an Article 11 a, a, a right to uh, strike. So the question then arises under Section 231, which we address on the next page, interference uh, with what? And I again invite your Lordships to look at uh, 231, and this really comes to the point my Lord Sir Patrick Elias put to me a, a moment ago. Interference what, with what? In our respectable submission, Section 230, subsection 1, is the entitlement to vote in the ballot. That is what not, must not be interfered uh, with, nor must any constraint <coughs> be imposed uh, upon it. The entitlement to vote at all. And we would accept that it, by implication it's the v entitlement to vote in the way that the member wishes to vote. So an interference that took the form of intimidation to vote in a particular way would also fall foul of Section 231. But one of the striking features of this case <coughs> is that nobody, so far as is known, was precluded from exercising the right to vote and the activities of the union indeed promoted the exercise of the right to vote. They encouraged people to vote. Of course, they also encouraged them to vote, yes, but everybody accepts, including Mr Justice Smith and my learned friend, that unions are entitled to encourage their members to vote in a particular way. What they mustn't do is stray over, to the, over the border into intimidation, fraud, and so forth. That uh, uh, dividing line uh, is one of uh, propriety but it also finds form in a case called Paul and Nalgo, which Mr. Justice Smith Swift, uh, Swift I'm so sorry, uh, dis disagreed with. Uh, Paul and Nalgo is in the uh, bundle and it's at tab 5. And it concerned voting for membership of the Principal Executive Committee of a Union. And the material passage is at paragraph 64, which is at page 49 of the Law Report. And the Certification Officer says, I'm required to consider whether these facts constitute a breach of the section, which is uh, be allowed to vote without interference from or constraint imposed by the union or any of its members, officials or employees. As I've said in a previous decision relating to this provision, the purpose of the section is to ensure that members are not subject to any pressure which would have the effect of preventing them from freely exercising their right to vote. In the past, my predecessors as certification officers have decided, and I agree, that the right to allow a person to vote without interference or constraint is intended to exclude such conduct as would intimidate or put a member in fear of voting or amount to physical interference. I'm satisfied that the inclusion of the material brought to my attention by Mr Paul falls a long way short of such comment. And your Lordships have seen from the Green Paper that's exactly what the, the introduction of the section <coughs> was intended to exclude. That sort of intimidation or putting people in fear, or amounting to physical interference. Now, I, we don't suggest for a moment that that's an exhaustive list of what amounts to improper uh, interference. Bribery, of course, would be a, a, 
likewise outlawed by uh, the uh, provision. But it's certainly a lot more in our respectful submission than simply encouraging a member to vote or to vote in a particular way or indeed to vote as soon as possible and if at work to vote work, to fill in the paper at work. But we go back to I go back to the point that the Mr Justice Swift in our respectful submission elided the two parts of section 230 and that interference or constraint is aimed only at exercise of the right to vote itself. Interference with the process of a postal ballot is not covered by section 231A but of course if the provisions of section 232 weren't complied with then that would be a breach in itself. But simply inviting, and I come now to section 232, simply inviting members to take their envelopes from the frames instead of allowing them to be posted through their doors in the normal way is not a breach of section 232 and if it's necessary to consider whether it amounts to an improper interference with entitlement to vote, it does not amount to, to such an interference or constraint. After all, the fact of the matter is that these envelopes would have been received by those members within a couple of hours in any event. Indeed, many of the, the ballot envelopes would be delivered by the member himself to his home address. Not in every case, of course. It's not suggested, and your lordships, of course, bear, bear in mind, it's not suggested that members were encouraged to take other people's envelopes, but only that which was addressed to them personally, with their name and their address upon it. And Mr Justice Swift below held that the in intervention by taking the ballot papers out was in fact a subversion of section 232 because as he said having caused the scrutiny to send the papers to the members homes the union took steps to prevent this from taking its course. Well literally that is true, that it, that it encouraged, the union encouraged members to take the envelopes before they were delivered to home. But can that properly be described as a subversion of the purposes of Section 232? In our respectful submission, no. What Section 232 requires is that the ballot papers are sent out by post and that they are returned by post at no cost, uh, no cost provision is in, in, elsewhere, uh, a return by uh, post. And that is, in fact, what happened. There's no requirement here that the ballot paper is received at the home address. And the union's got no obligation in relation to posting other than to have supplied a stamped addressed envelope and to have posted the voting paper and the stamped addressed envelope to the member at his home uh, address. It appears on the evidence that there was a practice of members taking their own post, not simply union post, but other matters, wage slips and so forth from the frames themselves. 
and the, the union utilised that practice. As was said in some of the interventions by union officials, which your lordships have seen, their pur purpose uh, was to ensure a high turnout. They wanted members to vote. The very purpose of Section 230 was something that the union was endeavouring to achieve. That's true, but there's also an element, isn't there, of um, seeking to uh, create a momentum for the voting yes. I mean, in, in terms of the putting people in the lines, posting and so on. I mean, uh, it was partly to improve, to create social media and indicate there are loads of people who are voting yes, you do the same as part of the yes. general advertising. Yes. And also wanting to increase the numbers to make sure, presumably, that they got across the 50% requirement. Of course, of course. But, it, but can one say of, of those desires that, that they are illegitimate? In our respectful submission, no. In, in every election, in every ballot, the parties to it encourage uh, voting. In general elections, people say, I voted. for a particular uh, party and before that they, they indicate by sporting badges or posters in the window which way they're going to vote. Here's a union simply using the fact that it's got access to post offices to show post or ver workers posting their ballot papers back. One doesn't know of course what the ballot papers contained, or at least it wasn't known at the time, but everybody was uh, obviously saying vote yes, because uh, as we see from the result of the ballot, that was the overwhelming uh, desire of the members. But one might not think that that is the, an appropriate way of encouraging uh, members, but it in our respectful submission, it cannot be said to be unlawful right, in breach of this section. It would be different if the steps that were being advocated by the union were designed to prevent the member receiving his vote or preventing the member voting. But that it was not the case. And the fact that there was such a high turnout demonstrates how successful the union was in ensuring that every member got his or her uh, vote and used it. This is a democratic success, not a democratic failure. Well, the, the question then comes as to whether it's implicit in section 232 that the ballot paper must not be completed at work. Our submission is that one simply cannot read into the absence of a bar on voting at work that there is a requirement that there should be no voting at, at the workplace. Parliament has not seen fit to require some system of, of polling booths under independent scrutiny as occurs in a general election or a referendum. All that Parliament has required is that the voting paper must be given to every member ent entitled to vote by post addressed to the home address. And in our respectful submission, Mr Justice Swift was adding in impermissibly 
words to the provision of the statute by suggesting that the union's encouragement to open the ballot paper and vote immediately, knowing that they would be, many of them would be at work when doing so, was in breach of section 232. There is no such statutory requirement or prohibition on working uh, voting uh, otherwise, other than at home. <coughs> Likewise, his lordship said below that um, the purpose of section 232 was to for members to have the chance to decide how to vote away from the day-to-day -day routine of the workplace or to allow people to consider and vote at home. But with a great disrespect, that's not what this statute does require. There is no such provision in the statute and one cannot be permissibly constructed from the fact that workplace balloting was repealed in section 200 and, uh, in, uh, in the year 1993. Isn't there an implication that if everything goes to course, uh, the fact that the voting paper is sent to him by post at his home address means it will be received by him at his home address, so the convenient opportunity is to vote at his home address. Obviously he can choose to take it to the pub or wherever else he wants to take it to, but isn't that the implication of uh, these provisions, if things go in the ordinary way? It, yes, the no normal situation is that the ballot paper will be received at, at home. After that, it's entirely a matter for the members to where he decides to fill it in, on the bus, home, and anywhere. But Having said that, that's the normal expectation. There's no prohibition on him or her taking it to work. The Parliament would not have contemplated, would it, that um, there is one union in a unique position to intercept ballot papers. Yes. Um, so uh, it would therefore not have seen any distinction between putting them in the post properly addressed and receipt at the addressee's home. Well, that's certainly true, my lord. The, the, this is a, a unique situation which is unlikely to re recur. But it, it, it does put the union in a difficult position because if the implication is that uh, CWU members mustn't take their ballot papers out, out of the frame, then it means in, in a future uh, ballot, the, a ballot could be frustrated by members doing that, and it may be said, well, the union didn't tell them that they mustn't do that and vote uh, at, at work. Uh, well, not if it doesn't encourage them to do that, surely. I'm sorry, Lord. Not, not if, it, if it doesn't encourage them to do that, then it wouldn't have uh, interfered, it wouldn't have done anything. It would be the spontaneous action of members taking them uh, out of the frames. And we've also been told there is a protocol uh, about that, although it seems, at least in some cases, not always to have been followed. Well, <coughs> Lord, yes, I, your, your Lordship's first proposition is that only the CWU could exercise the, could encourage members to intercept the post in this particular way. And I, I, I mean, that, that's obviously a, a fact. But nevertheless, it, it remains the case that Parliament has, has not stipulated that ballot papers must not be full, uh, filled in at work or anywhere else or said anything about where uh, balloting is to take, where ballot papers are to be completed. Well, then your Lordship saw just in, in passing that for merchant uh, seamen, of course, the provision remains that, that they have to be, uh, are allowed to uh, complete their ballot papers on the ship or a place 
uh, nearby the ship if they're away from home. So there's no, it, our submission uh, remains that there, there is simply no bar on members completing their ballot papers anywhere they choose to com, uh, complete them, at home, at the pub, at the workplace, with others, by themselves, or however. Lord, there was an issue below about instruction or encouragement. Uh, the learned judge uh, held that what the union had done was to instruct its members, but if he was wrong about that, then encouragement was uh, sufficient. And I see that Mr Carr's skeleton again repeats many times that the union's activities amounted to uh, instructions. Lord, Lord's in our respectful submission, that's simply wrong. It's quite clear that the words used in the uh, evidence is no more than encouragement. That's, that's what the union was doing. And once one accepts that the union were entitled to encourage members to vote and entitled to encourage members to vote yes and leaving them in each case with the freedom not to vote or to vote no, then the encouragement to take the envelopes, take their own envelopes out, complete it and post it back again is no more than encouragement of a similar kind and equally permissible. And one might ask rhetorically, and why not? Why, why should this be held to be improper in, in some way? If the result had been, or was even capable of being affected, or if there was some skullduggery that, that was evident, it might be different. But all those in forms of encouragement did was, were, was to produce a very high turnout and a very high uh, vote for yes, which clearly reflected the wishes of the membership. And it is significant that some 26,000 members chose not to vote, whether at work or anywhere else, And many members who had received their ballot papers at home brought them into the workplace in order that they could be filmed posting them. Uh, an activity which could not possibly be criticised in our respectful <coughs> submission. Well, then we come to section 230, subsection 4, the requirement of, of, of a secret uh, ballot. Lords, your lordships have, have seen the two clips at uh, Swansea. It's plainly a scene of great enthusiasm. Some 32 members present out of almost 10 times as, as many in the in that office and a maximum of nine members who appear to have marked their ballot papers in the company of uh, others. And his lordship below was right in our submission to say that there's nothing wrong with people completing their ballot papers publicly because of their enthusiasm. The obligation under section 234 does not prohibit this sort of enthusiasm. But his lordship held that it was different 
in the scene at, at Swansea. And the criticism of the union that is made is that by its encouragement of members to remove their envelopes from the frames, they provided the circumstances in which the members, some members at Swansea were filmed apparently voting in uh, public. <coughs> the question there, therefore is whether that is sufficient to amount to a breach of section 234. And our respectful submission, it is not. His Lordship below was correct to say that section 234 is an obligation on the CWU that voting in secret, but if members want to do this in public, that's no breach of the union's obligation. Well, there's no indication that the union was, was encouraging a non-secret vote. There's no indication that the members who, d who were filmed voting in public were do exercising anything but their own volition and enthusiasm. And the fact of the matter is that the number of members filmed voting in public is absolutely tiny. All right? Indicated as your lordships at the at, at the outset, this is the totality of the evidence on on the point. There is nothing else, otherwise it would have been produced uh, before you. So the question then arises that if your lordships are against me, that the union in some way was guilty of a breach of section two hundred and thirty four because its invitation to take the ballot papers out of the frames provided the circumstances in which ballots were completed other than secretly, then can the union avail itself of the defence of substantial compliance and de minimis? And so far as that is concerned, I've given your Lordships the percentages at the outset of our submissions this morning. If anything was ever de minimis, it's the number of ballots involved allegedly irregularly in non-secret voting here. Not encouraged by the Union, but merely where the unions where the union provided the circumstances in which such enthusiasm would be displayed by voting other than non non secretly well, th this was something that the learned judge uh, below didn't develop in his uh, uh, judgment but he re simply rejected the, the de minimis uh, submission without giving reasons for it. But in our submission, it simply cannot be rejected in that way. If this was irregular, it was a tiny irregularity. And it makes no sense to defeat a ballot of 83,000 odd voters, 81,000 odd voting in a particular way simply because a dozen people fail to vote secretly. So in our, our submission, uh, this should be uh, overlooked. So my Lord, my Lord. Have I um, correctly understood that from what you said that um, uh, your submission on substantial compliance and de minimis um, goes simply to section 230, subsection 4? I think it must do, my Lord, because I, I do accept that the number of people that took their ballot papers out of the frame is much larger than the tiny number who voted other than secretly. We don't know how many people took their ballot yes. papers out of the frame, but your Lordships are entitled to say that's a, a substantial number. 
But the difference is, of course, that in relation to that, on our submission, there, there's no, there's no um, defeat of the objectives of Section 230. The thing is that they all voted. That's, that's oh, I appreciate you say that um, you don't get to considering substantial compliance, yes. but um, uh, yeah. if, if there is interference, then substantial compliance doesn't arise under subsection 1, for example. Yeah. Interference ultimately goes to the integrity of the process, whereas you'll say in subsection 4, it's a minimum number of people and it doesn't actually affect the process at all. Yes, if, if there is an irregularity that your lordships find object, objectionable, then substantial appliance will apl apply to uh, 234. Well, can I just take a moment to course, make sure yes. I've covered the bases? Mr. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Britton draws to my attention Mr. William's second witness statements, which your lordships now have, uh, in which he says, and I, I won't ask your lordship to pull it out now, but it, he says that what happened in Swansea was spontaneous. The union didn't suggest to me that I should do this. The union didn't have any advance notice that this is what I intended to do. In fact, I only decided to make the video when I was in the can. Team. It was not uh, pre-planned. It was spontaneous. Yes, thank you. So, my lord, th th those are our uh, submissions. Thank you very much. Mr. Carl. Lord, it, may, it may be useful if I just outline yes, I'm sure. what I'll be saying in more detail this afternoon. And can I start with Mr. Hendy's observations about the democratic mandate, and he points to the very high turnout. The question that I say for this court is not whether the mandate is democratic in the sense that Mr. Hendy suggests, but whether that mandate has been secured in accordance with the statutory framework provided by Part 5 of the 1992 Act. Because by definition, you're only ever going to be in a court arguing about whether there is an, in an injunction should be granted in circumstances in which some form of democratic mandate has been secured by the union. Because by definition, if they've lost, then there would be no question of calling for industrial action at all. Well, Lord Hendy does say that um, 97 versus 2 is a bit different from 41, 50, well, 49. Yes, but... Um, the question still arises, has it been secured in accordance with the statutory regime? And it was nearly 10 years ago to the day, I think it was two weeks difference, that uh, Mr. Hendy and I, or Lord, he was Mr. Hendy then, he's Lord Hendy now, uh, faced each other in another industrial dispute, which was said to be a dark day for democracy, in circumstances in which cabin crew in British Airways had voted to the extent of 92.6% in favour of strike action, but had done so in a way that was impermissible in accordance with the statutory scheme. So you can't, as it were, say, well, never mind the statutory scheme, as long as you're confident that this is done, that this mandate reflects that a majority of the individuals who voted want to take strike action. We can, as it were, part what Parliament requires within Part 5. It just doesn't work. I'm not sure this is your best point, is it, Mr. Well, Carr? I mean, in this case, what is very exceptional is that it's a relatively, uh, certainly a significant number, but still a relatively small number taken overall of the whole load who are being balloted, because not that many people are necessarily going to take their thing out of the frame. Well, I, well I'm I'll finish it for a moment. I'm yes, of course. Yes. There is a very great majority in favour. The overwhelming likelihood would be that the vote would be the same. Now, you may not agree with that, but it seems to me for the moment that that's right. Now, at the end of the day, I do accept that's not the point. You're entitled to say that if there's been an unlawful interference, which goes to the integrity of the process, we have to grant an injunction, and that must be right. But um, insofar as Mr. Hendy is saying that it is highly unlikely that the result would have been any different, it's rather fanciful to think otherwise, isn't it? Well, the, the, the identical submission was made to Mrs Justice Cox in the British Airways and Unite case in 
uh, ten years ago. It where... might have been a right one. I'm sorry? It might have been the right submission. Well, it, it doesn't it, stop the injunction. No, but that's my point. That's my point. It, it, it may well be the case that Mr. Hendy's uh, union clients would have secured a, a hefty mandate. But it was interesting to note what he said towards the end of his submissions about this. Uh, he used the word encouragement. I'm going to use for the purposes of my submissions the word plan. He said the plan produced a high turnout and a high yes vote. That's his own words, not mine. So if one substitutes for the word encouragement the word plan, did this plan produce a higher turnout and a higher yes vote than would otherwise have been the case, then uh, it rather undermines his point that the democratic mandate is and of itself enough. Because one can see within part five that there are a range of obligations that the union has to comply with, some of which have nothing to do at all with the way in which the votes are cast. <coughs> so, for example, if one takes the obligation to inform the members of the, of the outcome of the ballot as soon as reasonably practical after the ballot closes, it's got nothing to do with the way in which the ballot itself is conducted, it's the way in which the outcome of the ballot is communicated to the workers. Similarly, the obligation to communicate the result to the employer as soon as reasonably practicable. Again, if the union falls foul of that, it is liable to be injuncted because it but hasn't complied. Mr. Hendy was, uh, Lord Hendy was disputing that. No, but my I thought his point was a much simpler one, that this is a case where the overwhelming majority are in favour. The result would have been the same. It, it's a jury point, if you like, insofar as you can say, well, it doesn't actually go to the heart of the question whether an injunction should be granted. Yes, well, uh, um, the way in which I hope to respond to a jury point is to say it is no more than a jury point because it doesn't fit in with the statutory scheme. The democratic mandate has to be secured in accordance with the statutory scheme. And the obligations under that statutory scheme are primarily obligations that fall on the union. So that if one looks at section 226, uh, which... you'll find behind tab one of the authorities bundle. Uh, one can see that the obligation is a union obligation under section 2262. Uh, and the reason I mention that is that Mr. Hendy has, for example, sought to make quite a lot of the fact that Parliament hasn't been prescriptive about the method by which workers actually do their voting. Parliament hasn't said, you, Mr. Individual Member, can only do this at the kitchen table and not at the pub, or the kitchen table, not at the workplace. That is not the scheme of the Act. The scheme of the Act creates an obligation on the union to conduct a ballot in accordance with the provisions of part five. That is one starting point. And that's why one doesn't see the act saying you can only cast your vote in particular circumstances. The policy of the act, as we'll see in due course, is that as far as possible, the union is to conduct the ballot in a way that avoids the pressures that can be brought to bear within the workplace. And as far as possible, that statutory objective is obtained by having what we'll see in the materials we'll look at this afternoon, a fully postal vote, which means in the normal course, what Parliament has anticipated should be the process is that the ballot paper is committed to the post in the overwhelming expectation that it will then be received in the post, thereby giving the member the opportunity to consider their vote away from the pressures of the workplace, if that's what they want to do, and put the outcome of that consideration back into the post. The plan which the union put into place in this case completely subverted that process. The plan was designed expressly to create a current of enthusiasm 
to whip the membership into a frenzy, and I use that phrase advisedly because it comes from the union's own head of communications, whip them into a frenzy in the workplace where they vote immediately and then form a line outside the sorting office to demonstrate to their workmates, to other union members, to potential voters, that they have done what they have been asked to do. And that, we say, that prescriptive continuum is entirely at odds with the statutory scheme. And the last point that I'll make before uh, the short adjournment is this. This was not a trap created by the employer. This was a trap that the union created wholly for itself. We know, because Mr. Hendy has told us, Lord Hendy has told us about it, that the union was perfectly capable of conducting a lawful ballot of the parcel force workers without any infringement of Section 230 at all. We also know that in 2017, the union conducted a ballot on a similar scale to this, and it was injuncted, but it was injuncted for entirely different reasons. It was failing to follow a contractual process that had been prescribed, had been agreed between the parties. But that ballot was done without difficulty. So there's no particular trap that's been set by the employer it is the union's plan, as Mr. Hendy said, to increase the turnout, to increase the yes, yes vote, which has resulted in the de facto substantial workplace ballot of which there is a raft of evidence. And the last, I said, that last point was going to be the last, but a bit like the Spanish Inquisition. Can I just make one other point in relation to uh, what Sir Patrick has said? The scale of this on the evidence we have at the moment, extends to at least 81 sorting offices. We don't know what went on at those sorting offices which didn't produce social media that we were able to look at. And one of the points that I made in my um, written submission was that the evidence that you have seen is likely to be the very lowest level of evidence that would be available at trial. So, for example, it's reasonable to assume that there were, in addition to social media outlets visible to my client, there will have been WhatsApp groups producing communications that were not visible to my client. Lord Hendy referred to CCTV in, say, canteens. Is that yes. standard? It is standard. It is, it is yeah. relatively no standard. that would have been poured over by Well, it, if, if, it, if it had been available. It's kept, my instructions are that it's kept for a period of four weeks. And by the time these deficiencies came to our attention, there was no ability to look at the CCTV. Because, of course, if we, if we had looked at the CCTV and found material, we would have reduced it. Fact is, we didn't have any CCTV so available. So the canteen in Swansea is social media filmed, not CCTV. It's 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 social media filmed by the local yes. union rep yes. who puts it on his Facebook account. Yes, no, I understand that. It's not from CCTV. No, 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 that no, no, no. It's no, it's it's Mr. Williams' own production. So what was that? Was any of it on the CCTV of the video we've seen? No, no. This is. That, and, and it's another point to make about the, the extent to which we say this was a union plan, rather undermining Mr Williams' position that he was doing this all off his own bat, is that all of the material that you've seen is material that we have obtained from social media sites under the control of the union or its members or officials. Right. Uh, so maybe it can be a point. point. Uh, to a point. Thank you.